Hey everyone, it's Andrea, and today our guest is Giles Fabrice, who is a scaling mentor for Pinnacle Global Network. Giles brings 34 years of coaching experience to his clients and has helped hundreds of new and high-level CEOs to scale to significant business growth. Welcome to the show, Giles. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to mention, in addition to that brief bio that I gave for you, uh, Giles and I have been working together. He's been one of my mentors for, oh gosh, five or six years now. And uh, Giles, you've helped me tremendously. I can speak to, are you getting feedback? Nope. I am getting feedback on my end. Ah. Uh, this weather as close to it as I can is it the rain yeah okay okay that's not too close I'm trying to get close enough right so if there is I've got close enough I've got wi-fi wired okay we're good we're good so in addition to uh, Giles working with Pinnacle Global Network, I can also attest to he's been a mentor of mine and helped our business grow tremendously um, for the past five or six years. I lose track because it's been such a, you know, time flies when you're having fun. But um, Giles is just a tremendously, tremendously um, resourceful business strategist. And he's the one that I go to when I feel like my hair's on fire in my business. And he's the one that gives me that calm voice of reason and really helps me think through and strategize and, and solve whatever problem that I'm having in my business. So, um, I can speak to how amazing you are Giles. And I know that our listeners are going to really get some good stuff, um, from our conversation today. So I'm excited to jump in. Awesome. Me too. Perfect. So one of the questions that I think you and I have a lot of discussion around, um, and I know that our business owners that are listening are usually questioning, well, gosh, when do I need a CFO in my business? At what level or what stage um, should I be considering to have um, a CFO join my team? And what's what are some of your thoughts around that? It's a great question. I mean, I would I would really ask a couple of questions. Uh, first question is is at what point are you in your business? If you're under a million dollars, right, you may not yet need a CFO unless you're incredibly well funded, right? And there's a ton of seed money sitting there, right? Um, I would say if you're under a mill, obviously understanding your numbers is really really important, right? But I'd say there would be three requisites. Um, you know, normally when I'm working with people and I, I, you know, I'll ask them a couple of questions. You know, firstly, when we're looking at the numbers, you know, how well do you know your numbers? If you're over a million dollars and your numbers are getting a little bit blurry, um, I think I would say, in fact, first question, um, do you know what your client acquisition cost is? Do you know how much money it really costs for you to acquire a client? And how much money do you spend, you know, if you're spending marketing money, which we're hoping you are, right? If you're spending money on marketing, what kind of a return are you getting for every marketing dollar? So if you can't answer that question, right, there's a good chance that you need a CFO. If you're over a million dollars and you can't ask that question, hire a CFO. A second question might be, um, if I'm looking at a profit and loss, Um, and I'm looking for a year in advance, am I able to estimate how much money will be in the bank each month for at least the very minimum the next six months, ideally the next year? If you're feeling like you can't make an estimation and you're really not being able to estimate, forecast your cash flow, at that point I would say bring a CEO in. CFO. Right. That, there you go. So if you're over a million bucks, if you're struggling with cash flow forecasting, if you're not understanding what your true client acquisition cost is, that's the time when you need to get somebody to be able to come in and help you with your numbers. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, biased opinion here. But what if if our listeners are are going, okay, I'm at a million. 
Check. Got that box covered. But I'm not sure what the, the client acquisition cost all entails. You have a really strong marketing background. So um, could you talk a little bit about that? So so when they're, they're calculating those figures, um, what are some of the components that go into that? I think you have to ask yourself, first, you have to look at your client and you have to ask yourself, um, from a conservative, I'm, not, I'm all about conservative numbers here, right? Look at a client, you have to say, what's the conservative amount of time a client will stay with me? You know, many people have clients that will stay for a couple of years. Is it a one-off sale or is it a sale that may continue? And really working out, you know, how many products do we feel or services would that product purchase from us? So firstly, being able to work out what is the client lifetime, the value, the client lifetime value? You know, sometimes this is why sometimes people do a loss leader because they, they're really very, very clear about what their client lifetime value is, right? Secondly, so, you know, you've worked out your client lifetime value. The thing that usually trips people up is working out client lifetime profit, right? Uh, many people underestimate how much money it takes to get a client and overestimate how much profit is in a client. Remember, you know, if, if, if you've got a client, a percentage of that money that that client gives you will go to keep the lights on. A percentage of that money that your client gives you will, you know, pay your insurance, right? Pay for office furniture, right? You know, um, all the all the the things that we, the mundane things that we lose out. The question, and this is why I would always say to somebody, if if you're over a million bucks and you're not sure about that, finding somebody that really understands like, okay, what are the costs? What are all the costs? And how do I work out a proportion of those costs? You know, if I've got an internet bill and I've got 7,000 clients, you know, people are, are using different products or services. How do I actually weight the, you know, a percentage, right? of the money that I, I bring in from a client. So I think sometimes that's where it becomes uh, difficult for, for people to really get to that accurate number. The reason I would say to some of these is if you're not getting that is to hire a CFO is, is one of the things that really bites people is this do-it-yourself mentality. So they think, all right, I don't know what my client lifetime value is and I'm not really quite sure what my client lifetime profit is. And remember, these are the numbers that if you get these numbers correct, right, you're able to really grow and scale your business. If these numbers are wrong, if you do it yourself, right, and you get the numbers wrong, you will literally be driving your business into the ground. I would say, I would venture further to say, you know, many of the clients that I, I typically encounter, I would say about 5 to 10% of the business owners that I meet when we dig into the numbers in a little bit more detail, we find that their marketing campaigns are actually costing them money. Mm -hmm. And that if they actually stopped their marketing campaign, they would be burning less money. They'd actually be more profitable if they stopped marketing. And I mean, that, that to me is quite a sobering thought. So whether you need to bring somebody in for the year or for a shorter period to be able to get those numbers down, fantastic. I would urge anybody to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think kind of piggybacking on that, what we see a lot of times is marketing dollars just get lumped together versus splitting those two into two different uh, buckets and saying, this is my new customer acquisition cost. And this is my uh, existing customers that I'm selling more to upsells, cross sells, things like that, because you're going to, you're going to have different marketing campaigns to each of those buckets. And if you're not tracking those numbers separately, right? It just all goes into one bucket, one expense line item, or even if you're splitting it out by like, I see some people listed out by my contractors or the different types of marketing expenses they're paying versus really having any kind of visibility into what's the ROI on each of the campaigns that you're running. And, you know, when you talk about loss leaders, 
I'll spend a thousand dollars all day long. If I know my profit from that client over their lifetime, you know, is going to be an exponential amount of that. Well, then that makes sense, right? You're, you're paying up front to bring them in, but you know that you're going to deliver services to them that far exceed um, that acquisition cost. So yeah, yeah, I see a lot. Uh, go ahead, Giles. I was just thinking if, you know, if, if you haven't got an understanding of your numbers, you'll never really understand how effective your marketing will be. You'll never really be able to test each channel. You'll never be able to say, okay, I know who I'm marketing to. There are more than one way of reaching these people. Um, how do I test that? I, I, I would venture to say marketing is, you know, it's much of marketing is understanding the numbers. And if you don't understand the numbers, you're really just, you know, throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing if it sticks, mm -hmm. right? The mark, certainly the marketers for me, the advanced, experienced marketers, I have not yet met one single experienced marketer that didn't understand the numbers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think too, one of the other things that trips up some business owners is they have a bookkeeper in place. And they're trying to get their bookkeeper to give them this analysis and this data. And what a lot of business owners don't realize is at some point you outgrow your bookkeeper. And if you're at that million dollar mark and above, like we we're just referencing, you, you've outgrown that skill set. You know, you still need that, but their skill set takes you to here. You need the skill set that's going to take you to here. And I think that's also something that I see a lot of. Um, you know, these poor bookkeepers are just looking like a deer in the headlights going, wait, what? You, I, I don't know what you're asking me for. Um, have you seen a lot of that in your experience? I think there's an interesting uh, concept for me, which is like, if you think about these startup businesses, um, let's use a million dollars as an arbitrary mark, right? What took you from here to here will not take you from, from, from here to there. There's a different set of skills, the very skills that you need um, to, to really, you know, to start your business, to have the energy to go forward, to not listen to the naysayers, to stay focused. These are the very things that allow you to, to be successful to a certain point. What's interesting is these same set skills are actually skills that are actually in, they're an impediment to scaling, Right. So they start off being an accelerant scaling and then they end up being an impediment. They're things that slow you down for scaling. Right. They're very like, all right, well, I think a lot of a lot of business owners, once you get to that seven figure mark, right, you know, it really does have to be ready, aim, fire, not ready, fire, aim. Right. And in the early years, it could be ready, fire, aim, and you can just keep working and working and working and pull it off. But as, as you get bigger, as you as you start getting into seven figures, eight figures, this sort of this this like we'll do it, we'll shoot from the hip, we'll hope it works. Strategy doesn't work. We end up with a with, with a second. Another question I would say, you know, thinking about questions to ask yourself around, um, you know, do you need a CFO? Is if you're ever not sure how much somebody should be paid. You know, a classic one is, is uh, salespeople. Somebody says, I'm going to hire a salesperson. And I'll ask them, oh, do you have a compensation plan in mind? Right? And they say, no, I haven't really thought about it. Right? And if you're hiring multiple people, really having somebody that can, can, can look at, you know, what, how, how can we appropriately price our products or services so that we can... We can pay people what they're requiring, you know, paying paying them a, a, a fair market value wage, something that will keep them in place, that will keep their business model, um, you know, less at risk, right? I think that's often another question that if you're not really sure about that, it might be worth, you know, you're over a million bucks, might be worth looking for a CFO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, making those decisions from the hip, you know, when you've got those extra zeros behind your revenue, um, it's a bigger way to fall, right? It's a, it's a longer, <laughs> it's a longer, uh, harder, faster drop when you've got money that, you know, you look and you go, oh gosh, had I had some more accurate data, I probably would have made a different decision and saved myself 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand. Um, you know, and then also when you look at the hiring, 
it's a competitive market out there. The job market is super competitive. And if you don't set your pricing according to what it costs you to truly deliver that product or service, um, you're not going to have the right margins in your business and you're not going to be able to afford to do all the other things that besides, you know, delivering on the sale, you've got to cover your general and administrative, your marketing, you've got to be making a profit um, and hiring people at the right salary level. It goes right smack in the middle of that. And so having somebody that can sit down and sort through all your, your chart of accounts, right? Look at here's all your cost of goods sold accounts. Okay. That dollar amount equals this percent of revenue. Okay. Here's all your marketing costs. That total equals this percent of your revenue. Here's all your general and administrative, your, you know, your rent, your overhead, all those things, your admin labor goes into that bucket and that equals this percent of your revenue. If you've never looked at it from that angle, then you're shooting from the hip and you're making decisions mm. in the dark. Going, going back to the scale concept, right? I mean, this is what I, I do pretty much all day, all day long is, and it's my passion is helping businesses scale, right? I think we have to look at the financial piece as one of the building blocks. You know, most entrepreneurs get, get caught up in, okay, I want to scale. You know, do I have a clear vision? And now I've got a clear vision. They jump forward into, all right, well, how do I find people? And, you know, do I have a marketing campaign? And then do I have a sales campaign? And operationally, how am I working, right? I think by taking that step back and saying, if you really do want to scale your business, that financial piece, right, it's imperative that you strengthen that pillar, right? If you think of the scale of pillars as strategic vision and cash flow and aligning the team and leadership of the team and the execution where you operate as these scale pillars, as your business grows and you strengthen these pillars, um, you're constantly going to be, be thinking, okay, one of them is going to need strengthening, right? Financial, managing finances. I think what my experience with many of my clients is they hire a CFO and then after they've hired a CFO, they invariably say to me, why did I wait so long? And I think that, you know, why did I wait so long? Um, or I thought I was saving money by not spending on these linchpin positions, right? I thought if I, if I didn't spend money here, I would, I, I would save money, right? But what we're really saying is, um, firstly, if you've got a good CFO, right, often their strategies will pay for themselves, right? It's very okay. rare that a good CFO doesn't pay for themselves, right? I've had CFOs that have, have, have alerted me to grants, free money, all these things where suddenly, you know, the client hires the CFO and the next thing they know, they've got this great grant, they don't have to pay for anything and they're like, wow, that's more than, you know, several years of what I'm actually paying for the CFO. But the, the thing that people also miss is, is this, this sense of certainty. I mean, I guarantee there's somebody that's, that's going to listen to this recording and they're going to they're going to be stressing about the numbers. So if you're that person and you're listening and you're thinking something like, oh, do I have enough money in the account for the IRS? Right? Am I putting enough away? Is enough money going away for sales tax if you're maybe you're a product person? Am I able to retain and keep people with wages that are going up? I think what we don't realize as as leaders is how much of of, of this how much of our brain that these thoughts take up until we've got somebody in place. And then at that point we go, why did I wait so long? This was nuts. I tried to do this on my own, right? And what I didn't realise was how much of my brain, how much of my bandwidth was being occupied by the, you know, anybody got a letter from the IRS? I got one from the IRS, and even though I knew it wasn't right, it certainly occupied my mind until I could hand it to an attorney and get them to sort it out, and they would tell me again and again, listen, everything's cool, right? Um, having people to be able to do that, in the absence of that, people worry and they stress. 
right? And often that stress takes away from their natural creativity or the number of sales they're making. So you've really got to see this as, as you know, as a, as a fundamental. If you don't see money management as a fundamental, I, I, I hate to say this, but many of you, if, if, if you, and when you, in fact, let me frame this in a more positive way. When you see money management as a fundamental part of your business, and, I, and how understanding the numbers are critical for your success, then you'll be able to multiply and grow. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. When you look at, as a business owner, how to spend your money that you've earned in revenue, there are expenses and there are investments. And when you're talking about a key position like this, it is not an expense. This is an investment. And anytime you make an investment in your business, you should be looking at what's the ROI that I expect to receive from this investment. And just like you said, every time you've had a CFO in place in any of your businesses that you've run and grown and exited, you have said, wow, this was my ROI. And you you were, it was very clear for you to be able to see that. And I think that a lot of business owners go, oh, this is an expense and I don't have the money to spend on it. But gosh, you know, just, just the clarity that a CFO provides, um, you know, it's like professionalizing your company. You can run as fast as you can run to get to, you know, a certain revenue level. But at some point, you need to put a professional team in place. Otherwise you're going to lose your mind. We've all been there, right? On our journey to grow and grow our companies. I think we brainwash ourselves. This is what I think happens. I think many people, you start off a business, right? And as we all know, I'd be very surprised if there's somebody that's watching this that says, I like paying taxes, right? So we start off in our business and we have our little income. And what do we do? We say, okay, I made half a million dollars and I spent X amount in expenses and X amount in expenses and X amount in expenses and my car's a legitimate expense and as is my apartment and as is this. And we have expenses and expenses, expense, 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 expense. And then at the bottom, we got nothing left. And we say, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Taxman, but I didn't make any money this year, right? And this is that early thinking which is like, all right, expense everything, right? Pay nothing, right? I think what happens is as our businesses mature, right, because we've spent those early years brainwashing ourselves, telling us, no, no, this is an expense. This is an expense. It's a legitimate expense, right? We forget that most of these things are not expenses, that they are actually investments, right, that they are an investment. I like to remove the word marketing. When I'm talking to business owners, I like getting rid of the word marketing. Sometimes people get caught up or they get tricked on the word marketing and they get stuck. And I say, okay, let's let's call it a different word. Let's call it money that we're investing to acquire more of the right people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get a bit freed up about that. Oh, okay. Now it's a slightly different conversation. Right. Most of them, the re- I think the reality is most of the money that we spend on a business, we're actually investing. We're either investing it in ourselves or we're investing it in an idea, but we are actually um, investing that money. The value of somebody that understands money, right, is they're able to reduce your risk and maximize your return. I spent X amount on my business, so I invested. Right. Again, we've got to get rid of this word spent like it's spent. It's gone. Right. So when we start saying, you know, if I was to say to you, you know, on your business team, you should have somebody that understands, uh, you know, how to create incredible products that people like or services. And everybody would say, yeah. And you need to find somebody that can do the marketing or find people. And everybody would say, yeah. And then we say, OK, now we need to. Find somebody that that enjoys articulating the value and selling. Somebody like me, I adore selling, right? Somebody who loves selling. Okay, yeah, we need that in the business. And then we say, okay, now we need somebody that can actually hold everything together and let the numbers tell a successful story. It seems pretty logical, 
But for some reason, because we've got so used to saying expenses, 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 we feel like an expense is where you spend it and it's not coming back, mm -hmm. which is the opposite. There you go. I think we brainwash ourselves. Yeah, I think so. And um, I think that when you were talking about your business is an asset that you're investing in and you're building, the part of the value of that asset is by having clean financial data, one. Number two is being able to show how, oh, I spent this, but this is what it made me. And, and really telling, like you said, the, the numbers tell a story, the data, the metrics, the the KPIs, the key performance indicators, they're all telling you a story. And if you have an interpreter, someone that can read to you and translate what the story is telling you, um, you know, just think about how much further you can go in your business when you have that, uh, that skill set, right, on your team. I think that many people have this reluctance because... They know then at some level, we all know whether we're doing a good job or we're not doing a good job, right? And I think for some people, it really is that getting stuck. It's that, oh, I don't want to look at it. What if it's, what if it's really bad? What if it's really bad, right? Um, putting your head in the sand is not a strategy, right? Hope is not a strategy, right? So, you're like quite, but I, I do think that that dissuades people. I think sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming, right? I think it's, you, you know, I mean, in choosing somebody to, also it's a question of being able to trust somebody. Um, but I think that the, the solution to that is, is to say, okay, well, what if I just had a conversation? What if I, what if I accepted the fact that I could find somebody that would help me speak the language of money and would help me keep a bit more money and whose job was to help me keep more money. I mean, if you think about it, that is the job, right? That's the job description at its, at its, at its greatest essence. It's like, I help you keep more money and I also help you invest money at a lower risk so that you can grow your business quicker with less risk really. I mean, it's these two words, risk and return. Mm -hmm. Game yeah. changes. Absolutely. So I think one of the really cool vantage points that you have um, in your profession is you get to talk to so many different business owners and you get to see so many different types of business industries, business models, um, all of those um, different, uh, and I guess, touch points really help you kind of boil it down and summarize like, okay, guys, you could be in any different industry at any, whatever it may be in your business. But if you want to get from point A to point B, here are some of the things you need to do. So what would you say, um, Giles, from, from just years of working with business owners, um, if somebody wants to get from, say they're at a million and they want to get to the 3 million mark, what would you say are some of the key things that in your experience you've seen really help move the needle? I think to get, you know, if you want to get from one mil to five mil, right? So firstly, I, I think I see about 200 business models a year, right? And that's actively participating, not just seeing, right? Probably a few more than that, right? So there are, there are some sort of things that trend and come out. You know, that's probably four or 5,000 business models that I sort of looked at, actively looked at, not just, you know, particip yeah, participated in. The quality, I mean, I, th I think you really need to look at these, these scale pillars and become a detective. You know, most people, if you get to a mill and you want to get further, I think one of the qualities is to be a detective, right? I think you need to understand. See, some people will say you've just got to act, action, 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 action. I met a lady, and I'll, I'll keep her name private to protect the guilty. I talked to her a couple of days ago, and um, she was talking about her marketing, and she tried 36 things in a year, 
She'd invested hundreds of thousands. She tried 36 different campaigns, right? She tried all these. So people either tend to try all these campaigns, right? And I'd said to her, huh, you know, you're tired of throwing spaghetti against the wall? She said, yeah, I really am. I said, what if we could be detectives? We could be detectives to understand your marketing before we start throwing money at it. You know, she'd hire a mentor or coach after coach after coach, and they'd just be like, take more action, take more action. And for me, it's like, no, let's just push the pause button here and understand the dynamic first. Let's talk to a few more customers. Let's talk to a few, uh, you, you know, let, let's really understand this dynamic. Um, with marketing, that's profoundly important. Understanding a sales process or a customer journey, a customer value journey from the moment the customer finds you all the way through, right, until they hand you their credit card and maybe stay with you for many years. So being a detective on, on those things, I would say, is, is really important. I also think being a detective with, with the numbers is important. One of the things I do when I work with people is very, very early on in our relationship, I would say to somebody, okay, tell me what your vision is, but also tell me what your numbers are, right? Because, and I tell them, we're going to be digging into your numbers. We're going to be looking, and I know it might feel a little bit painful to begin with, but I promise you, right, this will be helpful. And I do that for several reasons. Firstly, I want to tell them on the first conversation that I'm going to look at their numbers, because otherwise most people might say we're earning a little bit more than we are, and then they're going to seem a little bit embarrassed, right? But what happens is, is it, it, it feels, it's very, very easy, very, very quickly from, a, from my perspective to be able to really understand what's happening with the business. The numbers will always tell me the story. The vision will tell me what somebody wants to happen, right? The mission will tell me why it's so important that this person gets out of bed in the morning, right? The values will tell me who they are, but the numbers will actually tell me what's going on, right? They will, they will give me a story of what's happening, right? For me, in the absence of numbers, personally, I don't think I could help people grow their businesses, I think it would be an impossible. To, I think it would be a, a, a gut level task. I'd have to be incredibly intuitive, right? And I think there will be lots and lots of failures along the way. Really understanding, just very, you know, really starting off very simply. You know, how many of this product do I sell? You know, how many of what to who for how much, right? And what's my income? Very, very, very basics. You know, what do I sell? How many of these do I sell? right? How much do I sell it for? And then how much do I spend? And how much is left? You know, it's sometimes it, it doesn't matter how much money you earn, it's how much money that you actually keep, that's important. So I think, you know, that would be version 1.0. And I think when people do start understanding those things, and then when somebody says, Oh, okay, I'm starting to understand my business, then you start, firstly, I think you start really owning this okay i'm the ceo right you can walk in to a business meeting and you will probably know whether you can afford to do that deal or not in the moment i've had deals with some of the major big box stores and i've had some of the buyers that have said to me okay we'll give you x amount for one of your products and i've said i simply can't do it i appreciate the offer it's a lovely offer but that offer would make me go broke and i remember one of the one of the head buyers from a from a big box store um you know she said wow you really know your numbers and i said i know i'd love to work with you i really would love to work with you maybe we could revisit this you know in in, in the future at a, at a at a price point i think that understanding that's empowering i think understanding that that again remember if if you're not sure if you're listening and you're like oh, i don't get numbers right a good cfo a good mentor right, should be able to explain these to you in really simple stuff. I mean, heck, if I can't explain it to you in a way that I would explain it to a 10-year-old, that doesn't mean you have a problem. That means I have a problem. And I would say the same with the CFO. A really good CFO goes, listen, let me hold your hand here, right? In fact, I'll tell you what you need to check on, right? I'll tell you how often you need to check on it. But I'll, let, let me help you explain what's going on in your business. And I, I think that 
when people do that, they start feeling empowered. They start see, feeling free. And I think that's the mark of a, of a successful business. If you get your numbers, your chances of success, I'm guessing, are probably 10 times more than somebody that doesn't. 100%. 100%. That's why we see it. But, uh, you know, a lot of the businesses that go under, it's because they had a lack of financial clarity of what was, you know, really happening in the business. Um, yeah, such great advice, Giles. Thank you so much. And I know, you know, I can speak to you. You've seen my journey in my business uh, firsthand, right? And we have grown like crazy. Um, yes, we've had our share of growing pains and all the things that, you know, a fast growing business experiences. But, um, you know, sometimes you've had to even check me and say, go back and look at the numbers. You're moving too fast, right? Go back and look at your numbers. And it's that, that old, you know, saying like the cobbler's kids have no shoes because as business owners, that's just our natural tendency is to move fast. Right. And, and, the real value in what you're saying is slow down. Like you told the, the gal with her marketing and 36 different, you know, funnels or campaigns, slow down. And what is the data telling you? Because that right there, if you can interpret and be the detective, like you said, of the data, whether it's marketing, whether it's your uh, team's uh, utilization rate, whether it's your, you know, whatever it may be, there's so much data in your business. And, and if you don't have the skill set as the business owner to mine that data and interpret it and tell the story, then you need to bring in that skill set into your business um, because it's just so, so, so valuable. And I have learned, you know, through my business, through my business that every time that's what I need to do um, when I'm starting to, you know, get to that point where I'm banging my head against the wall, it's the slow down, you know, dig into the numbers. So Absolutely. He or she that understands the numbers, right, will understand their business. And we live in such a volatile environment. I mean, heck, if if 2020 taught us anything, it was that life can be unpredictable. In 2018, who would have predicted what would happen in 2019, 2020, 21, 22, right? Who knows what's in store for 2023? The landscape can change in a heartbeat, right? And if you understand your numbers, right, he or she that understands their numbers, right, stands a significant, I would almost say an incrementally better chance of prevailing. And they're stressed too. Mic drop. (laughs) Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Giles. This has just been such a great conversation. And I hope that our listeners got some ah ahas. And um, if they want to find out more about how to possibly work with you um, or Pinnacle Global Network, where would you tell them to go and and find out more info? PinnacleGlobalNetwork.com. And if any of you do have any questions, if you reach out to the team and you do want to send me a little message, I will endeavour to answer any questions um, for anybody that's um, on this call. So just mention, I was on a call with Andrea, right? Uh, I have a specific question, right? You could, in fact, you could email me. I'm going to say this right now, right? It's Giles, G-I-L-E-S, at Pinnacle, G for global and for network. So Giles at pinnaclegn.com. Shoot me an email if you have a specific question. I'll be I'd be happy to help you. Awesome. Such a go-giver. I love it. And um, I can just attest that if Giles does give you an answer, it's gold. So be very uh, appreciative and, and thankful. And Thank you, Giles, for being on today with me. And um, if you guys are interested in hearing more about any questions that are financial and you want to reach out to me, um, we've got all our links below. And uh, Giles, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks for being here.